Shalom, Dr. Dina Dai here with Foundations in Torah. Welcome to this Torah portion, Shalach, from the book of Numbers, Numbers 13 through 15. Shalach basically means to send out. And so here we have the probably one of the more famous stories in the book of Numbers, the sending out of the spies to investigate the land of Canaan. Um, what's interesting, though, and though we translate it spies, it really should be princes because these are the leaders of the tribes of Israel. We'll talk about that more in just a second. So just a quick overview of this particular Torah portion. We talked about the, um, the spies, the princes, going out to investigate the land of Canaan. They're sent out from a place uh, that's called in Scripture the Wilderness of Paran. To, uh, now they do scout out the land, and in particular they end up at a place called the Valley of Eshkol, and we see there that they are carrying the most famous picture imprinted in our minds of them carrying a cluster of grapes on a pole. So from this experience, Caleb, Kalev, encourages the children of Israel, yeah, we can go up and we can capture this, no sweat. But the other princes, the remaining leaders of the tribes, are look at the situation and say that the people are stronger. And so they gave, quote, a bad report about the land that they had seen. Uh, because the land devours its residents. This is particularly significant because if you consider this land is God's sacred space. This is the, the space that he has set apart for his divine presence. This is no small thing that they're saying that the land devours its residents and it's a bad land. Um, the, the, the identity of the land is, is connected to God himself, which he has taken this land and set apart as holy and sanctified with restrictions placed on it as the place where he wants to have his presence dwell in the midst of his people. So um, needless to say, they suffered the consequences for that declaration. In essence, we could compare this to um, Adam himself, who um, because he didn't guard uh, uh, the garden in the way as a priest and king as he was uh, called to by God and allowed, if you will, an enemy into that sacred space. And he allowed that enemy to, um, to defile the sacred space. Is In the same way we have the enemies living in the land of Canaan, God's space, and they are defiling that space and God has sent the people to reclaim it and to restore it, and this is the response that comes from uh, the remaining princes of the, of the tribes, except for Kalev. Now, in this Torah portion, it goes on to tell us the people uh, grumbling, complaining against Moses and Aharon. Again, this is, this is not just idle talk. This is, uh, this is grumbling. This is declaring um, that their allegiance is no longer with God himself, but with God's enemies. This is quite significant. Uh, they are declaring they wish they had died in Egypt, that they wish that they were back in exile, back in the nations, and back in the place where they exalted the worship of false gods. Now, uh, can we say that all of them did? We don't know, but they were living in a land surrounded by the gods of Egypt. And so we can imagine that many of them had fallen into those cultural norms of that particular land, just like we do today. And sometimes we don't even know that we're worshiping things other than God himself. Now, in spite of all this, God forgave the people, but they were, uh, their bad report about his land, his sacred space, but they were still going to reap the consequences of that. And God declared that no one who saw his glory in the wilderness, that is the, tabern the place of the tabernacle, where is the place of his presence, no one there would see the promised land, the, the, the land God has set apart for his people that he may dwell in their midst, except for Caleb, Kalev. And so all those who spread this bad report would uh, ultimately die from a plague, kind of like what had happened in Egypt. And so, uh, again, this is all part of Shalach, the numbers. And as we go through the uh, numbers 13, 14, and 15, we have a, a section in there that describes unintentional sin versus intentional, willful, and defiant sin. So that's all in this Torah portion as well. And then this particular Torah portion cl closes out with a commandment by God for the tzitzit the, and to have the, uh, a blue cord.
in the tzitzit as a reminder uh, to the mitzvot of God, to the commandments of God. So those that the blue in the in the fringes would remind them of his commandments. That blue called the techelet, which comes from uh, the hilazon snail. And so that uh, that's kind of the overview of shalach. Now, again, um, each Torah portion that I've been doing this year, I've been laying a bit of groundwork to understand, to give you kind of the big picture so we understand some of the details that are going on in this particular Torah portion and, and the others. And so we know that the children of Israel have come out of exile in Egypt. We know that God has defeated their enemies. And uh, we know that in the wilderness, the commandment was to build a house for him, the tabernacle, the Mishkan. And I've talked uh, before about the Genesis chapter 1 pattern being a pattern for God building a house for himself to dwell in. And that pattern of house building is the entirety of the cosmos. And once the house is finished... That, de- that signifies that rest has come, enemies have been defeated, and God is ruling and reigning and seated on the throne. It is a time of inauguration of his sacred space, and it is a time of dedication of that house and the enthronement of the king. That is the, probably the definition of creation as we see it in Genesis chapter 1. Now when we come into the wilderness, we are having what we call new creation or recreation, that a new house is built because the previous house, the garden, had been contaminated and had been removed so that it could, could heal. And so after the defeat of Egypt and Pharaoh and the enemies of God, a house would be built. God commanded and gave the instructions to Moses on top of the mountain. The mountain actually is synonymous terms with the house. And he was given the design and plan for the Mishkan to build. And so he was given master craftsmen who would build it. So this is language of new creation. So of course, they are not in the land. They are not in the, um, the land and the earth were essentially synonymous. So the earth was God's sacred space where he desired to dwell in the midst of his people. But they are outside the boundary of the sacred space in the wilderness. But even within the wilderness area, within that, they build this house for him. So uh, that house is what brings order out of chaos. So the wilderness or the seas in scripture represent chaos. Anytime you see language of raging rivers and raging seas or seas in general, it's speaking of a world of chaos. When a temple or house is built, that chaos is removed. We see the same thing in the wilderness. The wilderness itself represented a chaos environment. There's no water. Crops don't grow. It's dry and parched, and you die of starvation and thirst. It's a place where wild animals and beasts live and jackals and all this sort of thing. So it is a land understood to be a land of chaos. And then within that area, they build a house for God. So within the midst of chaos, they build a house to bring order to the boundary and the sphere in which they live in. So the place of God's presence is the place of order and rest. It's where God rules and reigns. And so we see with Shalach them rejecting his sacred space. This is no small thing. Once a house was filled, uh, oh, excuse me, once a house was completed, as in the tabernacle or the creation house, uh, then it was filled with something. And in the case of, of God's temple, it was filled with his presence. And so from that point, God would maintain his creation through his divine rule. And this is, this is the basic language. And again, I keep reiterating this, but it's important because we, don't, we will not understand what is going on in these Torah portions if we don't understand the sacred space that God has, has created for his presence to dwell in. So again, I mentioned they sent out a, a spy or a prince from each of the tribes to scout out the land of Canaan. It was at this point that Joshua, uh, Hoshea, was given uh, a, a different name or a letter was actually added to his name, which changed his name to Yehoshua, son of Nun, which uh, from the root we get salvation. Uh, it's the same as Yeshua. These are similar terms to save. And so he is the one who saves. He's son of Nun. Um, just as an aside, one of the names for Messiah, he is called Messiah ben Nun, uh, sometimes Messiah, Messiah ben Anan, uh, 
um, Messiah ben Nun, meaning uh, the king of the seed, the son of the seed, Messiah ben Anan, the son of the cloud. And these are essentially titles for the king. And um, it is a picture here, if you will, of Joshua, Yehoshua, taking on the kingship, and which he will do when they cross over the Jordan and enter into the land. Um, at that point, he would... Uh, Moses would no longer, uh, Moses was not to cross over into the promised land, but Yehoshua would be sent forth. So this is language of kingship because now uh, Joshua, in essence, would be king over the community. The people ask as they go in, what was the land like? Are the people strong or weak? Are there few or many? Is the land good or bad? Are the cities walled or unwalled? Is the soil fertile or is it poor? And so they report back basically that the people are much stronger than they are, that the land in essence devours its residents. Again, this is God's sacred space that he has set apart for his people where he would dwell in the midst of them, and this is what they're saying. They look at the enemies there and they see men of great size and describe themselves as being grasshoppers, like grasshoppers. And so this is really a failure of leadership on, this, on the uh, side of the princes. And really, this particular Torah portion has probably been preached about more than just about any other, speaking of looking at your circumstances or your obstacles um, as ones, yes, that can be defeated or ones that you're going to be enslaved to. It's a very interesting portion. But this concept of a failure of leadership uh, is probably more important than just about anything because ultimately we are affected by who is ruling over us. If we have a benevolent king ruling us, then, and this was true in the ancient world, he would, he would bring prosperity and blessing uh, to the people. If they had a bad king ruling over them, uh, it affected, it brought chaos, affected the, the, uh, the cosmos in effect. They would experience cataclysmic type events and all of the consequences would fall on the people for bad leadership and really nothing has changed. And so the consequences of this failed leadership of these princes who did not recognize God's sacred space, God's sanctuary that was the land where they would uh, have authority over it and rule and reign from that place just as Adam did in the garden. The consequences is that an entire generation would be essentially destroyed by a plague and would not be able to enter into the land. So again, this is significant. All of this in uh, Numbers 13 through, well, in particular Numbers 13, 14, is really what we would call is kingdom language, and it's taking us back to the garden. There's a lot of patterns and similarities between the, the, the garden and Adam ruling over it, a failure of leadership, and what happens because he allows an enemy into the sacred space. Uh, he is then exiled out of the land. In this case, the children of uh, Israel are not allowed back into the sanctuary, if you will, the garden sanctuary, as uh, the land of Canaan was. And so the, and the discussion about the soil, uh, is it fertile or poor? Because it's taking us, it's giving us imagery of the, of the garden where things were easy to cultivate and things grew and provided food for the community where then Adam was exiled out of the garden, where they are currently living in exile out of the land. Uh, in the wilderness, the soil is poor and nothing grows, and the area they're in barely gets any rain. And so it is uh, a recipe for starvation and thirst and really a recipe for disaster. Also, they ask about the trees. Again, this is garden language. Is it the season for the grapes? All of this, if you can put it in that particular pattern, is just speaking of... How does it compare to where we are? And you would think that they would want to go up and take the land since it is uh, the representation of the cluster of grapes is enough to want uh, you to enter into the land. So uh, as they crossed over and they explore the land, they came to a variety of cities, in particular to Hevron, um, which in scripture it tells us there that was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt, which is interesting. They, would insert there, I would uh, focus in on the seven years part there, as I've talked about. In the ancient world, we find all over the place, not just in, in Israel's economy, but in the ancient cultures, the number seven always had to do with temple building, 
and uh, temple dedication and completion, house building, if you will, for the god of the ancient world. So it's interesting that this is inserted in here. Again, they reached the valley of Eshkol. They cut a single branch, the cluster of grapes, and carried it on a pole between the two of them. And still even seeing what the land would produce was not enough for them to change their opinion. Uh, Hebron or Hevron is actually a picture of heaven or paradise. The, the sages tell us it was actually the, at Hebron where Adam and Eve were supposedly buried, but the, uh, the tomb of the patriarchs for uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and wives was, the, um, was considered the entrance to the, to the Garden of Eden, the entrance to the garden, the place of paradise, the place from which everything would be restored. It tells us also that they cut pomegranates and figs. Um, so this was a very lush and luxurious, luxuriant uh, type environment. And we have the language of the 40 days that they returned after 40 days with their uh, stock or their cluster. Well, uh, just as an aside here that uh, I mentioned probably in previous Torah portions that this idea of the stock is significant is any time you have descriptions of a stalk or a vine or a pillar, uh, a ladder, a stairway, an altar, a mountain, all these things are communicating something from the ancient world, and that is whatever that is, a, a tree, for example, was the meeting place between heaven and earth. So it was significant that they entered into this land that was God's property set aside for them his sacred sanctuary and from it the fruit that grew just compare it to the fruit that came forth from the garden the fruit that grew the and from this stalk was telling us something about a relationship here between heaven and earth because God's presence would re reside in the place the temple which was the place between heaven and earth so that's part of the of this discussion um, you'll find that they, uh, in the ancient world, they talk about these, the stalks, the vines, the trees, etc., as the axis mundi, which just means the, the axis of the world, the center of the world. And, and we can see in a tree that axis would be, a, would be a vertical, but it was also horizontal because it was seen to be the very center where heaven and earth connected. And so the land, again, is this, signifies this return to the garden sanctuary, which represents the place where heaven is on earth. And as they crossed over, eventually they would be led by Yehoshua from the tribe of Ephraim, the son of Nun. And of course, uh, all of this, the language of the 40, which we have virtually everywhere. We see them in the wilderness for 40 years, and here they enter into the land for 40 days, which I'll talk about in a little more detail in a couple of minutes is quite significant because the number four is usually associated with the natural world and the number seven associated with the eternal world. Internal world. And so again, the reports given to Moses when they come back and to Aaron and the entire community by the princes. And here they are showing them the fruit of the land, that it is indeed a land flowing with milk and honey. But on the other side, the that these people are very powerful, they can't be defeated, their cities are, por are fortified, we can't capture them, their cities are large, the people are large, they saw the sons of Anak, which were said to be large people. Uh, they describe their enemies living in the land, uh, uh, specifically the Negev, Amalek is there, they've seen the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, all living in the mountains of the land, and then the Canaanites we see living near the sea along the, uh, and along the banks of the Jordan. So all the enemies they ever had are in the land. That's how they're viewing the land, and that the, they control it, and there is no way in their minds that they can take that land. And Caleb, Caleb, the one who says, yeah, we can capture it. So the complaint of the uh, princes resonates strongly throughout the camp as they are critical of God's sacred space. And so, um, again, this is a, an example of the decline, if you will, in the leadership and the kingship and the rulership over Israel. And people succumb to that bad rulership and 
the voice of Kalev was not enough to overcome that. Now, of course, they would really love to just go back to Egypt where in their minds everything was great. They raised all night. The community had received this report and raised their voices against Moses and Aaron. They wept and, um, they, and wished that it, had they just died in the wilderness. It's as though they were making a declaration that they preferred to be in exile, that they preferred not to have the presence of God in their midst, that that was too hard, that was too difficult. They preferred to be in a place where other gods were in their midst. They preferred to be able to choose their own leader, not to choose the one that God had chosen to be king. Moses, when they were in the wilderness tabernacle, Joshua, as they would be crossing over. They preferred then to return to the idolatry in Egypt and worship, uh, in essence, the gods of their enemies, is basically what they're saying. So in response, Moses and um, Aaron fall on their faces, plead, pleading with God, make, trying to, in an effort to make atonement on behalf of the intentional sin and willful disobedience of the people. Joshua, Yehoshua, and Kalev tear their clothes and declare that the land is good. Now, it's not just the land is good. This takes us back to the creation wink once again. When something is declared good, it doesn't, it's not an adjective where that's, that's nice. It's declaring that this land is functional and has a purpose, and that purpose can be realized through the people of God. That God's creation de being declared good means that his house that has been built, cre the creation house, is functional and ready for operation. So basically they're saying, Kalev and, and Yehoshua, that the land, it's ready for us. It's ready to be functional. It's ready for us to move in and take the enemies and return this land to God so his presence can be in the midst of, of us. And they understood that God would give them the land. However, God's response is that they would, he would strike the people with a plague and destroy them. But ultimately, the, the greater promise of making them into a divine nation of the fruitfulness, fruit, being fruitful and multiplying and fill the earth, that promise had, had not been abrogated because of this. And uh, if they were to go up in their own strength, they would, not, they would no longer have the covenant protection because they would once again be violating or breaking the covenant, and by breaking the covenant, they would be exposed to the wrath of God. So all of this, once again, going back to the failure of leadership. Of course, the assembly wanted to stone them for their response. Um, however, the glory of God appeared at the tent of meeting, and we see here at Moshe reciting what we call uh, part of the 13 attributes of God, and actually the 13 attributes are laid out in the book of Exodus, but there are a few here that he talks about God in terms of being slow to anger and abundant in kindness. This is covenant language, forgiving of iniquity, forgiving transgression and punishing to the third and fourth generation. This is all language of covenant. This is covenant language and what happens when you break covenant. And so he's, he's reiterating a portion of these 13 attributes of God. But God, again, promises he would make Moses into a great nation. That is, he would follow the kingly line from Adam all the way to Moses, and he would restore that. And without the forgiveness of God, that meant that they would be in permanent exile, in a place of, ultimately, of death, permanent uh, separation from God himself, that the house would never be rebuilt, and the house was the only, only place where new life could come forth. It meant there would be no seed. And so it tells us that as sure as the glory of the Lord fills the entire earth, none who saw my glory or my miraculous signs, who tested me ten times and did not obey my voice, none of these will see the land that I promised. And so um, in essence, they would be in exile for eternity. Um, he talks about his son Kalev being different an interesting, Kalev's name, Kal, which means all, and Lev is a heart. So he is one who exercised all his heart in this regard. He and his offspring would inherit the land. And um, so all of this language going, he was one described as having a different spirit and that he would be brought into the land for, here's our 40 years once again. 
in, in contradistinction from that, those will, others will suffer because of their unfaithfulness uh, until their corpses were consumed in the wilderness 40 years, corresponding to these 40 days. So that, now we know why, where they got the 40 years from. So again, we've talked about them returning, uh, to, desiring to return to chaos, really. That's what they're saying. Those who were 20 and older, uh, who were actually numbered in the sen census, um, who grumbled against the Lord, um, he would bring in their children, but not them. Um, and so the people mourned, and they rose up the next morning and decided to go up on the high mountains, and which is a temple pattern, and they say, let's go up to the place of God um, where, that he promised to us because we have sinned. So they worked exactly backwards from what God had commanded. So they were going to be uh, basically reap the consequences of that action. Moses tells them this is never going to succeed. Um, that's not the place of the presence of God. He is not in their midst if they are walking in disobedience. So he tells them, don't go up there because if you do, your enemies are going to defeat you. Of course, they go up anyways. And so this, again, breaking the covenant. Um, the consequence for breaking the covenant means they are outside the, um, the protection, if you will, of God and they are exposed to the wrath. Now it goes on to tell us about the covenant meal being eaten at the entrance to the gate. We see that in the tabernacle, and this would be the same as they would cross over the Jordan because it's, uh, that is the, the river, that is the entrance into the land. It is as though they're entering into a house, a place of covenant protection, and this is where they would make the fire offerings and the grain offerings, etc. So you always had a covenant meal at the entrance to the gate, wherever that gate was. Um, so there's, uh, the, the, they were warned not to prostitute themselves with other gods. They were to call, to remember and obey that God is holy, that he is the one who brought them up out of Egypt. And now we have a bit of a discussion between unintentional sin in the community and versus intentional sin in the community. And there really wasn't a mechanism for intentional sin. The unintentional sin, the atonement was provided by the burnt offering, for example, uh, and the other uh, regular daily offerings, but there wasn't really an, uh, a way to uh, deal with intentional sin. And uh, that we will see uh, exercised in Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, in which the high priest went into the Holy of Holies. So defiant sin meant that they would be permanently cut off. So we close out with the tzitzit, that they were put on the corners of their garments in order to remember God's commandments. That was a way that they would remember and, uh, and we have the, the blue thread that would be in the, in the fringes. And so uh, this is a very rich um, Torah portion, and um, hopefully you got a lot out of it. See you next time. Shalom. Thank you.